that's in northern, uh, kind of north central Greece. And uh, you can put that first slide up a little bit. And uh, it has an interesting rock formation there that's this huge cliffs. That's one of the places you go ahead and go to the next. And there's monasteries built just on the very top of these rocks. And I wanted just to show you a particular one. If you go ahead and hit the next one. This made into the rock, made in the 15th century. And uh, this one is particularly significant because uh, Barbara always tells us that we're all saints, but Barbara proves it because this is named St. Barbara. I'm not sure if y'all saw that, but I'm sure still do. Make sure that y'all all can work up to something. <laughs>
rebellion. Uh, that's just uh, one man fulfilling just eight of those prophecies. And what about 16? The, the odds of one man fulfilling just 16 of the prophecies that are given in the Old Testament regarding Jesus' first coming. Uh, see, I had to write how to say the number in parentheses. <laughs> one in a trillion, 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 trillion. That's one man fulfilling just 16. That's, that's pretty astounding, isn't it? Uh, what about 48? One man fulfilling 48 of those prophecies. Well, you can count the trillions there. One in 10, the way you write that number, one in 10 followed by 157 zeros. That in itself validates the, uh, not only the scriptures, but it validates the fact that Jesus uh, is indeed the Messiah because only the divine Son of God could fulfill those prophecies. So how many of the 300 plus prophecies did Jesus fulfill? All of them, that's right, all of them. Um, if you would, open with me to before, just hang on right there for the slide. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter 24. <coughs> Luke chapter 24. Um, we'll come back to the song in just a minute. This, um, <coughs> this account we're going to look at here, and actually today's lesson will be a good lead-up to Resurrection Sunday. Luke chapter 24, this is the account that Luke gives us of the resurrection of Jesus and his encounter on the road to Emmaus. And I had no idea Ronnie was going to lead that song today when I had planned this. Uh, just a few hours after the sun. One of my favorite songs, choir singing that today. The road to Emmaus. And this account, that account of the uh, two travelers on the road to Emmaus following the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the two travelers were walking along the road and Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, came along and just fell into step with them and was walking along with them and they did not recognize him. Uh, so now look at verse 27 of chapter 24. As they're walking along, oh, wouldn't you love to have been one of those travelers. Verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Oh, he gave them a Bible study as they were walking along. Isn't that thrilling? But you know what I love about that song, it reminds us that... Uh, <coughs> That last verse of the road to Emmaus, which we'll sing today. Uh, oh, that I could have the chance like they did just to hear the Savior teach uh, from out of the Scripture. But I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me, and He teaches me. So we do have the teacher with us. We, we can have that road to Emmaus experience of having Jesus revealed to us through the Scriptures. Isn't that, isn't that thrilling to think about? Jesus began at Moses, and of course at Moses meaning the first five books of the Old Testament, what the Jews called the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. How could Jesus teach about himself by referring back to the books of Moses? Because the books of Moses all point to Jesus. The, the Old Testament scriptures all point to Jesus. They reveal Jesus, whether with prophecies like we just saw, those various prophecies, Micah, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would ride a donkey into Jerusalem, he'd be sold for 30 pieces of silver, and so on. But then the typologies, there are numbers, hundreds of typologies, we probably could say thousands, that point toward Jesus. For example, the tabernacle, everything about the Old Testament tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle, reveals Jesus. It points to Jesus. Even the furniture, uh, the golden lampstand that was in the uh, in the tabernacle. And of course, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And there's so many things. Just that study of the golden lampstand is a, uh, is a fabulous study because there's so many things about that that point to Jesus, that reveal Jesus. So Jesus uh, began to teach them at how 
the, uh, the books of Moses, the Torah, and not only that, but also the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, even uh, uh, Ezekiel, the, uh, the minor prophets, they all, he said, they all were talking about me. That's what Jesus was teaching. They're all talking about me. Don't you get it? They're all talking about me. Drop down to verse um, 36. After he leaves the travelers, uh, down to verse 36 now, uh, the disciples are meeting behind closed doors. Look at verse 36. And as they thus spake, the disciples, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. See, he just appeared in the room. This is the resurrected Jesus. Verse 37. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen the Spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit, or a, you could say a ghost, hath not flesh and blood as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy, you know, they would say, oh, this just can't be. This just can't be. And wondered, he said, have you here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a raw fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So he adds the Psalms here. And those things that were written in Moses, the books of Moses, the first five books, those things that were written in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of those prophets, as well as in the Psalms. So can we say that the Psalms themselves are prophetic of Jesus? Yes, there are many, many prophecies that are in, uh, in the Psalms. Now, let's go back to Psalms, and let's look at a couple of those. Go back to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 2. Let's just look at 2. There are certain Psalms that we call messianic. That is, they are prophetic of Jesus. They talk about Jesus. Look at chapter 2. <clears throat> Now, there are, uh, uh, one of these days I'm going to teach on the, what the Jews call the Midrash. Midrash is just, that's, that's, a, that's, the, that's actually the method of teaching prophecy. That there is a primary fulfillment, but there is also a secondary fulfillment. So, some of the things that David wrote about, uh, that could be applied to himself actually have the greater fulfillment in Jesus. Now, looking at chapter 2, uh, this is actually <coughs> prophetic. This is one of those Messianic Psalms. But this is actually prophetic of the battle of Armageddon. Now, look at chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. This is, this is like a conversation between God the Father and the Son. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, just keep your marker at, there at Psalms and flip with me back over to Revelation chapter 15, last book in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 19. Now, keep in mind here that God the Father says to Jesus the Son, You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's what's going to happen at the 
battle of Armageddon, when uh, the nations of the world are gathered there, uh, they think they're coming to annihilate the Jews, <coughs> the nation of Israel, and it turns then into a uh, into an assault against uh, the very Messiah Jesus and His second coming. Revelation 19, beginning at verse 11. This is so familiar to you. I know this is the second coming of Jesus. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True and in Righteousness. He doth judge and make war. And I won't read all of that, but drop down to verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. You see, it picks up on that same theme that is given back here in Psalm chapter 2. He shall smite them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay, so uh, that actually Psalm 2, that is that is just that is prophetic of the battle of Armageddon and the role of Messiah Jesus in that. Turn in another psalm, just look over to Psalm chapter 16, and let's look at one more. And we're going to read in on three of the uh, three of the psalms that are prophetic. Psalm 16, verse 8. This is a passage that is prophetic of the resurrection. Now, I know we tend to think of the psalms as just being um, I guess we could say inspirational. You know, I was talking with an individual this week who was just going through some great difficulties. And, uh, and and I told her, I said, oh, just turn in the Psalms. And I gave her a psalm. And I said, that psalm will just give you such comfort and it will give you such encouragement. You know, I think we tend to turn to the psalms in times of, uh, of those times of great need when we just need a word of encouragement from, from the Scriptures. Uh, it's wonderful to turn to the Psalms and always find one there that addresses our situation. But let's keep in mind that as well when you are reading the Psalms that there are many prophecies that, that point toward Jesus. So I, I would encourage you as you read the Psalms, you know, just kind of keep an eye out for those prophecies. In chapter 16 of Psalms, look at verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption or decay. So, this is prophetic of Jesus in the grave. Uh, this is saying this was the, the, the prayer, the confession of Jesus. I know, Father, you won't leave my body in the grave, and uh, I will not see decay. Verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy, and thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, not will I uh, suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, let's turn over to Acts chapter 2. I know I'm having to do a lot of turning here, but look at Acts chapter 2, where Peter is preaching, and he quotes this verse out of Psalm 16. Acts chapter 2, looking at verse 22. This is on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood to preach. Acts 2.22. Ye men of Israel, keep in mind, this is Peter preaching. Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Death could not hold him in the grave. Verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, <coughs> having loosed the pains of death because it's not possible that he should be holden of it. Verse 25. For David, see now he's, re he's referring to the Psalms, for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart 
rejoice and my tongue was glad moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption so you see Peter quotes from Psalm chapter 16 so that is prophetic of, of the resurrection of Jesus so I just point those out to just remind you that the Psalms are indeed prophetic and I hope as you're reading the Psalms that you will just be attentive to those prophecies. Now, back to what Jesus was sharing on uh, not only the road to Emmaus, but then as he uh, appeared to the disciples, he said he taught them those things concerning himself in Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Now, the Jews, now we can go to the next slide, yes. The Jews divide the Old Testament, they call it the Tanakh, they divide the Old Testament into three sections. The law, the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, because that's where the law is given. They call it, of course, the Torah. It's also called the Pentateuch. Penta means five. And then the prophets. And thirdly, the writings. Now, sometimes they're called just, uh, just the writings, but that's a reference to Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, 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 just those those inspired writings. So that's why Jesus gave that division out of Moses and the uh, prophets and the Psalms. Today I want us to look at three of the Psalms. Chapter, let's go to chapter 22. Three Psalms that are right together called the Shepherd Psalms. Uh, let's look at the Psalm 22, 23, and 24 are known as the shepherd psalms. Chapter 22, this is a prophecy of the good shepherd, and I'll spend most of our time today, what we have left, on chapter 22. The good shepherd dies for his sheep. Chapter 22 of Psalms is uh, the most graphic uh, description of the crucifixion in the entire Old Testament. And then, of course, chapter 23, the psalm that we all love, The Lord is My Shepherd. That is, that's the psalm for the great shepherd, the great shepherd who cares for his sheep, which we are today. So this psalm, chapter 23, is applicable to the role that Jesus is filling today as our great shepherd caring for us providing for our needs and then Psalm 24 we have the chief shepherd there he's the chief shepherd who will return as king of kings and lord of lords and he will establish his kingdom in the earth so those three psalms right together chapter uh, Psalm 22 the good shepherd in chapter 23 he's the great shepherd in chapter 24 he is the chief shepherd alright let's look at um uh, Yes, Psalm 22, the good shepherd dies for his sheep. Would you turn over to Psalm 22, please, if you haven't found that. This psalm is descriptive of the physical suffering of Jesus on the cross. It's, as I said, it's the most graphic description of the, of the crucifixion in all the Old Testament. Now, what's amazing about this description that we're going to read in chapter 22, where David prophetically describes crucifixion. At the time of David, crucifixion was not a method of execution. What would have been the method of ex execution in David's time? Stoning. Yes, stoning. Uh, crucifixion at this time had not even, I hate to use the word invented, I, I see that sometimes in theologians use that term. They say the Romans or even possibly the Persians invented crucifixion. I say they devised it. Uh, but that came with the, mainly the Roman Empire, which did not come into power didn't even rise in existence for hundreds of years after that. <coughs> Keep in mind that David lived and wrote a thousand years before Jesus was born. A thousand years he preceded Jesus and yet he prophetically gave us this graphic description of the suffering of Jesus. 
uh, notice the first verse. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my glory? Of course, that immediately is familiar to us because where did that come from? Yes, we know that as the words, yes, that Jesus spoke on the cross. So, um, Jesus actually made a veiled reference to this psalm in John 10, 11, when he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life or dies for the sheep. He gives his life for the sheep. So Jesus was actually making a reference to Psalm chapter 22. Now, we have, as I said, the physical suffering of Jesus. What chapter do we have in the prophets that is a description of the spiritual suffering of Jesus on the cross. There's another graphic chapter on the crucifixion in the prophets. Anybody know where that is? Very famous chapter. It's in Isaiah. Isaiah 53. Yes, Isaiah 53. Would you just keep a marker here at Psalm 22 and go to the right to Isaiah 53? It's right close by there. We have studied Isaiah 53. I wish that we had time to just read this, uh, read Isaiah 53, then go over and study Psalm 22, but I would encourage you to read Isaiah 53 uh, at your first opportunity. Uh, Isaiah 53, and of course this entire chapter is a description of the crucifixion, but look at verse 4, um, well even verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shares is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Oh, what a, what a beautiful, beautiful chapter. Uh, if you're into memorizing chapters, I would encourage you to memorize chapter 53 of Isaiah. Let's go back to Psalm 22 now, and let's just take a look at the just... The amazing detail that's given in Psalm 22, a thousand years before Jesus experienced the crucifixion. Uh, looking at verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my glory. Uh, this is the only, the only occasion when Jesus referred to his Father as God is on the cross. Uh, there are 170 references in the Gospels where Jesus refers to God as Father or my Father. Only this one time on the cross does he say, my God. And of course we know that he refers to the Father as God because Jesus, all of our sins, oh, and I, I am looking forward to teaching on what really happened on the cross. Now, all of our sins were, to use an accounting word, were imputed to Jesus. All of our sins were laid upon him. And yet, his righteousness was imputed or laid upon us. There was a transfer that took place on the cross. I really don't think the body of Christ as a whole is aware of and fully, I don't think we get everything that happened on the cross and that transfer there of our sins and uh, upon Jesus. Our sins were imputed to Him. They were placed on His account. They were placed on Him. And yet, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, uh, it's about verse 19 there, that, that His righteousness was imputed to us. In other words, that was laid on our account so that today we, do not, we don't bear the penalty for sins. Jesus took the penalty for our sins. He took the guilt of our sins. That's why the writer of Hebrews says that uh, 
we no longer have to have a sin conscious consciousness. We don't have to be sin conscious because the penalty for our sins, the guilt of our sins, all of that was laid on Jesus. That is that is shouting ground, folks. That is shouting ground. To know that all of our sins, past, present, and future, have been laid on Jesus. He took the penalty. And when Jesus said, and we're going to find this in Psalm 22, where Jesus said, it is finished. The telestai, that Greek word, which means paid in full. Paid in full. Oh, do we get it? No. That's exactly right. No, we don't get it. We don't get it, do we? And I, I say that across the board. The entire body of Christ. I, I just don't think we get it. Pay it in full. Do you know that, that word to tell us that, which concludes chapter 22. It's in the last verse. That, uh, our King James, our English says that he hath done this. He hath done this. He has done it. It is that same it is that same word for what Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. The telestine. Pay it in full. You know, when uh, in, in, in New Testament times when a one had been charged with crimes, had committed crimes, and he paid his debt uh, to society. He fulfilled his sentence in prison. And when he was released. That, that person who had served his time, he received a document that had all of the charges that had been leveled against him, and across that, it was the word was written to tell us that, paid in full. And that ex-convict would carry that document with him so that if ever anyone tried to bring up those charges or remind him of his past, he would whip out that document and he would say, paid in full. The charges no longer apply. Oh, people, I, I just praise the Lord this morning that whatever, whatever sins have been in the past, and I have to say past, present, and future, Jesus has paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He has paid it, and he has paid it full. I'm telling you, when the devil tries to drag up your past, you whip out this document that says paid in full. The charges no longer apply. Someone, Jesus, took the charges and paid my debt. There's another old song that says, He paid a debt. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt and He did not pay. Oh, that's what's meant by all of our sins being transferred to Jesus, imputed to Him. And yet, His righteousness, His righteousness, is imputed to us. It is reckoned to us. That's why I have a big, big problem with people who say, I'm just an old sinner. We're just all sinners. Mm. <laughs> what does a lawyer do? A lawyer practices law. What does a doctor do? A doctor practices medicine. What does a sinner do? A sinner practices sin. Are you practicing sin? If you're born again, no, you're not. Not to say we won't sin, we do. We do. But we don't live in it. We don't relish in it. People, people, I, well, I just don't need to get off on all that. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to teach, I guess, what I, we're going to do very soon. We're going to do that study very soon. Uh, that is just something that's just been working in me. Let's go back to chapter 22. I've got to stay on task here. <laughs> Let's go to verse of chapter 22. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime. Now keep in mind, this is prophetic of the words that Jesus would say on the cross. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night seasons, and I am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. You see, Jesus, and of course we don't have these words recorded in the Gospels that he said them on the cross, whether he said these words or whether this was just his state of mind. And he was saying, Father, you delivered your people in the past. But you see, there is no deliverance from him for Jesus. He's going to pay the penalty. Verse 5. They cried, in other words, your people in the past cried unto you and you delivered.
delivered them. They trusted in you and they were not confounded. In verse 6, this is prophetic of the <coughs> description of the taunts and the ridicule that Jesus endured upon the cross. Verse 6, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Now keep your place right there and turn over to Matthew chapter 27. And let's look at Matthew's account of the crucifixion and how this was fulfilled there at the cross. Matthew chapter 27. Verse 39. Now keep in mind that Psalm 22, Psalm said of Jesus, they laugh, they shake their head, and they say he trusted in the Lord and he would deliver him, but let him deliver him, see me. Uh, if you're God, you down on the cross. Look at chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyed the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. <clears throat> Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others himself. He cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. So you see how those words of the psalmist were so graphically fulfilled there at the cross. All right, let's go back to Psalm 22, verse 9. 22, 9. This again is Jesus, the words of Jesus. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was in my when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Now, I've heard people ask the question, when do you think Jesus knew his divine mission on the earth? When did Jesus know that he was the promised Messiah? We know, of course, that when he was age 12 and he was in the temple talking there with the doctors of the law, that he said to Mary, his mother, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? So we know that at age 12 he knew his divine mission. But according to this scripture, Jesus knew his divine mission from, as he said, from his mother's belly. From the time of conception, he knew that he was the promised Messiah. I was cast upon thee from the womb, thou art my God, from my mother's belly. Verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have come past me. Bulls is just a... That's, a, that's symbolic of demons. Oh, many bulls or demons have compassed me. Strong demons have beset me round. Not only were the those who were mocking and ridiculing Jesus there around the cross, but Jesus, you see, was had, there was this spiritual warfare that was going on. Even the demons of hell were tormenting thinking they had won a victory when he was there on the cross. Verse 13, They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. You know, we, we've probably all seen that movie, the Mel Gibson movie, uh, The Passion of the Christ, and that to me was so graphic, but that was not, to use a quotation, that was not a drop in the bucket to what Jesus actually suffered on the cross. I know when I was sitting in the theater we were watching that and that just became so graphic at a point there and I still have that picture in my mind I'm sure as you all do and I just I just shut my eyes I thought oh I just I can't take this I can't take this and it was like the Lord just said to me well I took it for you I just want to interrupt this minute say thank you to the class for supporting the jail ministry when I was there Tuesday night the girls told me and I, I had thought about it I know I have a copy up there uh, to tell them be 
sure before Easter what day. And they told me, they said, we watched it yesterday. And she said, we, this jail, we all fall and fall. And this is like a part of that. Praise the Lord. And I yes. Guess. Yes. If you didn't hear what Joanne was sharing, of course, uh, she and Dexter have the jail ministry. They go and minister there at the Mary County Jail. And uh, she encouraged them to watch that movie. No, I haven't said anything yet. Oh, I had told them. Oh, you were going yet. to tell them to. Tuesday night. Yes. And they told me that they had watched But they did watch it. Actually, they watched the Christ. And she said that we, we bothered us while the whole time. Well, one of them. Thank God that I have to leave. Yes. Yes, right. And thankfully, and Joanne was thanking us for having a part in that. We, of course, we support financially. Our class does help support that ministry. So that's a, that's another outreach for our class, and we appreciate your faithfulness in carrying out that ministry there. Chapter, back to chapter 22, uh, down to verse uh, 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Now, what scripture should that remind you of? My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. In other words, he was dying of thirst. What did John tell us that Jesus said on the cross? I thirst, yes. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for the dogs have compassed me. Again, speaking, that's demonic. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and store upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And we know, of course, that the soldiers gamble for the garments of Jesus. Matthew tells us that in chapter 27. Be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horn of the unicorns. Now let me stop right there. That phrase there, thou hast heard me. You see, as this is, we have recorded the words that Jesus spoke on the cross there in the gospel. But this, all of this that we, that we read here, so much of this I think was just roaring within Jesus. Uh, in his spirit, in his mind, as he cried out to the Father. And, but he says in verse 21, But you have heard me. You have heard me. Now, if you have the NIV or the Message Bible or the Revised Standard, it does not include, it does not have that phrase, you have heard me. I'm kind of like Andrew Womack. Get you a real Bible. There are several phrases that the NIV has omitted that we have in the King James. I think most of you that have been in my class for a period of time, you know how I, I'm not a King James only. There are some people that say they're King James only. I, I'm not, I, but I use the King James for study, and, but I have a lot of other Bible translations for references. But uh, I, to me, there is just nothing that beats the, the King James. So Jesus says, for you have heard me. Now how do we know that the Father heard him? Because he was resurrected on the third day. Verse 22. I will, and this is where the resurrection part starts. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation while I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. And when and he could say, When I cried unto him, he heard me. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear me. Uh, Jesus is just declaring the faithfulness of God. I'm going to tell you, God is faithful. God is faithful. I don't care what the circumstances say. I don't care what the report says. God is faithful to His Word. Verse 26. 
The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek Him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship Him. You see, uh, this is just praise to the Father for the resurrection. Verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and He is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before Him, and none can keep alive His own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. That's actually, uh, that's actually prophetic of a scripture that's in Isaiah 53. Verse 31. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Now, that's what our King James says, that he hath done this. But you need to circle that because you know actually what, what that says there. To tell us stop. It is finished. Paid in full. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. Folks, that's us. That's us. We are the people that shall be born. We are that seed that came forth out of the side of Jesus. And the psalmist concludes that with paid in full. It is finished. It's a done deal. And Paul says it because he lives, we shall live also. That's how we can know that we're, we're going to be resurrected because Jesus himself was raised. Well, I, in chapter 23, which is the psalm of the great shepherd, and of course we're familiar with Psalm 23, and I intended to read this, but our time's all gone. Uh, this is the great shepherd who cares for us now, the resurrected Lord who is caring for us, who feeds us, he provides for us. And then in chapter 4, this is the chief shepherd who shall return and establish his kingdom in the earth. Uh, let me just point out one verse in chapter, uh, in chapter 24, verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Now, I know that, the, that a primary fulfillment of this was when David brought the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem. That's when David penned this, when he moved the Ark to Jerusalem. But the greater fulfillment will be when Jesus comes back in his second coming and he goes into Jerusalem there to establish his kingdom. And we will be with him. So at the psalmist says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. He's talking about the gates of Jerusalem. And be ye lifted up, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Oh, and we're going to be with him, folks. Zechariah chapter 14 describes Jesus going into Jerusalem through the east gate. And then in Ezekiel 43, I really wanted us to read that. Make a note of that. Ezekiel 43, 1 through 7, also describes Jesus going into Jerusalem as well as Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Oh, our resurrected Lord, our chief shepherd. Peter says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall give us the crown of glory. Oh, can you just say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. I tell you what, I am so full this morning. I'm just spinning up. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here this morning. And as I said, next Sunday, Tate will be here to share with us about this just exciting uh, ministry and KT and what's going on with that. And we are supporting that. And as individuals as well. And the next Sunday, Lady's Land will be sharing about 